How many feel just a little bit more refreshed after that praise and worship this morning? We need it. We need it. You know, the world wants us to be aware that the devil is alive and well on planet Earth, but how many know the Almighty is too? And he's working. Last week I dealt with being aware, and unfortunately didn't record, but I'm trying to work it into an article. <clears throat> but we need to understand that God is constantly speaking. He wants to fellowship with us. He wants to empower us. He wants to help take us from where we are to where we need to be. And we learned last week that the, the den of life, the noise within, can drown out the voice of God. And uh, we need to begin binding up that noise. We need to, we need to really tune our ears into him and really be aware of everything in life. We need, I, I kind of think that Hollywood is um, doing these zombie movies as a way of making fun of Christians. It's, it's almost, I, I just kind of get that sense. They think of us as the walking dead when they're the ones that's really the walking dead. We're alive. But it's time for us to wake up out of slumber, for us to really be aware. And this morning, I kind of want to blend the concept of being aware in where we have been dealing with the fire of God. And I, I kind of feel like as we've been dealing with the fire of God, I've kind of lost some of you. Because when, when you... The minute we begin talking about anything, whether it's the fire of God or prayer or, or anything, it immediately goes through your own, your own filter of what you have been taught before, what you have experienced before, whether it's for or against and all these different things. And so when we, sometimes when we say something, we really don't hear what's being said. We have that all the times in our personal communications that, that somebody, you know, somebody's saying tomato, but we're hearing tomato. We're, we're, hearing, we're hearing a completely different definition based upon where we come from. And really, guys, when, when you talk about the fire of God, some think of revival that sweeps nations. Some think of signs and wonders, and all they're about are signs and wonders. And I mean, no, signs and wonders are good, and they have their purpose but if you're two signs and wonders oriented, you can get off because the devil will give you some signs and wonders. I've been in some services. I've seen some signs that made me wonder. Like, how in the world could you ever think that that was God? And I, I have witnessed what some have called revival, that there was no real fruit to it. There was, it was, yeah, you had that manifestation but there was no holiness, there was no humility before God. You see, in olden days when they had revival, when you talk about Charles Finney, all the taverns closed down, they don't get bigger, they don't get, you know, they don't start up five more if you have a revival in that town. Things don't get worse, they get better because people are, are tuning their ears into God. Sometimes when we think of, of the fire of God, we think of classical Pentecostal services. Now we're almost just kind of close to that this morning, just a little bit. But sometimes I think of almost the scenes off the Blues Brothers when they end up in that church and there's people doing backflips and walking on the backs of pews. And people think when they say the fire of God, that's what they think. <clears throat> Some from different backgrounds will think of weird manifestations. They'll think of wildfire or spiritual air. So when, when you say something sometimes, we all have these cubby holes that we want to put it in, don't we? And what I guess what I'm feeling, and, and I'm kind of sensing in the spirit, is that my cubby hole is different than your cubby hole, <laughs> and a lot of people's cubby holes, even those that are talking about the fire of God. I want to make sure that our own definitions are based on really what God is saying to us in this hour, because really, guys, Hebraically, we need the, the art of listening is not to be heard, but to hear. And we have kind of lost that in the church. Very, it's Greco-Roman to be heard, but not to hear. If you'd ever see rabbis in, in a yeshiva school, they'll say, all right, I want you to, to take this argument. Okay, you're for this, you're against this. And they'll argue for about 15 minutes. And they'll say, stop, now switch. So the guy that was actually against it is now having to, to, to do a, a session for it because what they realize is until you understand what the other person is saying, you can never hear. If 
You never really know where they're coming from. And how many times have we done that? And just in a lot of ways, with, even with loved ones, they're saying one thing, but we're filtering it through something else. And we don't really hear what they're saying. Here's what I believe. The more I study, the more I pray, I believe the fire of God should be a part of the normal life of the believer as defined by Scripture. It's not something that happens occasionally. God created it for us to be walking in it all the time. I want to go to Acts chapter 2, and I want to read verses 1 through 4. And in doing this, I'm not going to get Pentecostal. I'm going to get fiery, a little bit different. Because when you read Acts 2, 1 through 4, everybody gets caught up in tongues. Now, I'm not against tongues. The Apostle Paul says you can't forbid it, even though denominations do. I mean, direct scripture, it's like, thou shalt not forbid the speaking in tongues. Yeah, but Lord, we got it written in our bylaws. But it's not the centering up on tongues because how many of us in the past have seen believers speak in tongues but had no fire? They couldn't even have got kindling going. Look what it says here. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a mushing, rushing mighty wind, and all the house were filled where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues like unto fire, and it sat on each of them. We forget that part. And that is, I think, the most significant part part of Shavuot is the fire that set on them when we realize what Jesus did for us at the cross. Now hold on just a minute. Now we need to connect it with Mount Zion and Shavuot, the first Shavuot, God's mountain was on fire and it shook and it even scared Moses. Now there's a portion of that fire in the manifestation of the Holy Spirit that comes and sets on them But then there's a revelation the Apostle Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says, know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Do you not know that you are now the temple of Almighty God? God's temple had fire in it. All three courts had fire in it when it was functioning right. There was fire in the outer court. For the brazen altar, there was fire both on the altar of incense and on the menorah when it was lit, and the glory of God over the Ark of the Covenant was a fire. So when we look at all three functions, the the body, the soul, and the spirit, it was all there to have the fire, to function with the fire. And let me ask you something. Could it really be a temple without the fire? How many know in the day of Jesus, the temple was really limping along? You know why? The Holy of Holies was empty. You go, fire, fire. (laughs) He never got to the bang. It was fire, fire, because it was empty. Could you imagine the high priest every year walking into the Holy of Holies and sprinkling the blood on nothing? Which, in actuality is a violation of Torah because you can't let the sacrificial blood just hit the ground. It made it common. All three of those areas were created in the new birth. God, part of our normal, daily, weekly experience should be fire in the outer court, fire in the inner court, and fire in your spirit. That's normal Christianity. But how many know right now when we're looking at the world, normal is really kind of hard to find? What's normal in an insane asylum? Come on. I've I've had friends and associates that have worked in insane asylums. Whether they're their staff or they're the you know the PhD, the psychiatrist. I, I had one psychiatrist, he said, you know, he says, I wonder, he says, I've been here so long, I walk away wondering every day which one of us are crazy. <laughs> Cause it's it's like if you're around that all the time, it becomes normal and you begin doubting 
who you really are. We're in a world right now that is set on fire with ungodly fire. Normal ain't normal no more. And the more you try to stand up for normal, the more you're persecuted. I was reading an article this week in the military. You know, when Chick-fil-A had the, the thing for, for the uh, standing up for traditional marriage and they were, they were having the, fish fillet, or the chicken fillet things and everybody flocked it because of what they'd done. There was a guy that was active duty that actually took a day off and went and was serving chicken at a Chick-fil-A saying, I stand with marriage too. Did you know now that his, now because he did that, his career in the military is being jeopardized? Good has become evil, and evil has become good. And the church has lost its fire. We are more like the, the temple in the day of Jesus. The only time that the manifest of glory of God was ever in that temple is when he walked in on two legs and went and worshiped at the temple. We go through the motions, but we don't have the power of what we need. And see, God doesn't just want his power here. How many know God wants the same peace that we felt here during praise and worship? He wants it in your home. Let me tell you something, especially for our kids. How many know out there, it's not peaceful? It's crazy. They're stress. They're, they're being pushed on every side. But at home, they've got to have love. At home, they've got to know the presence of God at home. They've got to know that peace at home. And see, that's part of the fire of God. You've got to keep the light burning, if you will, with the fire at home. Now, I've been asked, okay, now what do we do? And uh, I just want to touch some, more, there's some, some basics this morning. Because the fire isn't something special you bring. I think that as we begin doing some things, it's going to kindle back up. I think for a lot of us, when you get saved, there's a fire within. I remember when you first got saved. I mean, you just thought God could do anything. I mean, God saved me. Look what he did. If he could save me, he can do anything. And that fire was there. But then the things of life just kind of choke, choke out that flame. And what we're wanting to do is to rekindle the flame, restore the flame. When we look at the outer court and the inner court and the function of the temple, and this is one of the things that I'm, I'm coming to realize, is that there are, there are certain things that always went on. Now, in the outer court, besides the brazen altar, how many of there was a lot of activity in the outer court? Besides the brazen altar. That's where all, everybody came to praise and worship God. Part of what we did this morning was that outer court experience. Now, we ended up, I think, pretty doggone close to the Holy of Holies because of we, we went from praise to worship. But they would go and they would pray and they would seek the face of God. They would praise and all these different things. And guys, we need to learn how to praise, not just at church. I think we did a pretty good job of it this morning. I think sometimes you got to get an attitude about praise. I'm going to do it whether I feel like it or not because it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't change who he is. But if I connect to who he is, it'll change how I feel and what I'm going through. I want to go to Psalms 34 this morning. And I really tried to think of a lot of places to go there. The Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people or God is enthroned in the praises of his people. I thought about going to that one, or how about that when we praise him, it stills the voice of the, of the enemy and the avenger. But God took me to Psalms 34, and there's a lot of good stuff here in Psalms 34, and I think where we're headed, it's going to be essential. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is important. We're going to go, we're going to find out verses 1, 2, and 3, Activate verses 4 through 10. I will bless the Lord when it's convenient. Is that what it says? At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's not just for church. Should be a part of our daily lives. 
Look what it says in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. You cannot disconnect that from the first three verses. Snippet theology will get you to the place to where you don't find how to light the fuse. You don't find how to activate something. When I praise him and I magnify him, it causes, it causes an atmosphere around me that when I call upon him, he delivers me. If you'll praise God during the hard times and the good times, when you need him, he'll be there. I don't want to be like the guy on the Titanic and they had tried everything and finally a guy said, I think we should pray. And they say, oh my, is it that bad? You see, if you start with something first, you start with the right thing first. If I praise God, it sets things in motion in this temple to where I am attuned to him and he is attuned to me. He said, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me out of all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around those that fear him and delivered them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no one for them that fear him. The young lion do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. All of that is connected to praise. You take out praise and none of that will function. I have seen the righteous go hungry because they had no praise in their hearts. I've seen them cry out to the Lord, but it's been so long since they've ever plugged in and had a connection. You know, on the internet, there's something when you're wanting to make sure that everything's running right on a network, you send a ping and it'll bounce to the router, and it'll bounce back, and it'll let you know everything that's online there. Praise is like a spiritual ping. It makes sure that everything is connected with God, and when his presence comes in as you're praising him, you know everything's connected, so that when it's connected, when I call upon him, there's the connection. But if we have a lifestyle of not praising God, we have unplugged ourselves from our helpline. And the first thing the devil tries to steal when he comes after you is he tries to steal your praise. He tries to steal your joy. We need to have praise and worship in our homes. Have praise and worship in the car. Up here sometimes when, when I'm working with a school, and if I'm, you know, if I'm reading a dissertation, it's kind of hard to have praise and worship on. But on, on the times that it's just busy work, I have seen that I get stronger. I have more clarity when I have praise and worship on. Now, for me, some of, some of the newer, real rocky songs are kind of hard for these old ears. I, I don't want a cat fight in the middle of my praise and worship, Okay. But that's why there's something called iTunes that you can actually create your own playlist. And I'm getting ready to start making my own CDs that I like this song, this song, this song, this song. We'll let Junior listen to. And then, you know, and then you can actually press your own CDs if you want to or create your own playlist and just have that going all the time. One of the things I was uh, impressed about with uh, Kevin Tabucci's home is they had praise and worship going on from the time they got up in the morning in their house. Even when they weren't there, it was still going on because they wanted to create an atmosphere of praise and worship in their home. And it, it, it continued until they went to bed at night and they turned it off. A few times we were praying and the song didn't quite match the prayer. He, he went and shuffled it to the right kind of song. because it you know. But the, to be that aware of what praise and worship does. That's why in our services we need to give it our all. Now, if you, if you were spiritually sensitive at all this morning, we did some praise, and then there was some resistance to try to come in and to stop that praise, and then we broke through, and when we did, yeah. stuff happened. Because the devil said, no, no, you can't do that. No, 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 just, just be in the moldy grubs. You've had a rough week. Oh, praise the Lord. That's not a sacrifice of praise. We need to get the loudest when we've had it the worst. Freaks the devil out because he knows what's coming. You plug into God and you start, 
you start talking about how magnificent God is, God comes in and shows up for you. I don't know if I've told this story or not, but when Kevin and them, their, their church got into construction and they went into a place that uh, it was condos, but it had been overrun by uh, the gang, so there was drugs and prostitution and murder and everything going on. They took that over and they, they be, then remodeled the whole thing and basically told the, the gangs to hit the road. And so they had what the gangs call an enforcer, we would call him an assassin, came to Kevin's house and said, you know, we're not going to tolerate what you're doing. And uh, Kevin's about this tall, he's Japanese. Got right in this enforcer's face and said, Satan, you're oh so small compared to my God. And he watched as the hand of God came down and grabbed that guy, and the guy fell under the power of God, and God began to crush him into the floor to where the guy was crying out in pain. It's like God was making a point. You're dealing with my kid. You're dealing with a praiser and a worshiper. You don't come into a man of God's house and threaten the life of a man of God when that man of God is really serving God. That's the power of the God that we have. And I think part of what, what allowed that to happen was they're praisers and worshipers all the time. They're either listening to it, they're talking about it, talking about how to move in it. We need to get that way. And sometimes, and I mean, you know, Mary and I are not omniscient. We don't, we're not, we don't know every Christian song that's out there. You guys may hear one that's good. You want to pass it along to us. I know Steffi's done that. I know Troy and them have done that. Hey, hey, this is great. This is something I've listened to. It really touches my heart. We'll listen to it. Hey, boy, that'll work great. That also lets me know you're listening. <laughs> Our houses need to be filled with something besides as the stomach turns. Come on. The next thing that we need to do is we need to learn to activate our faith. I, th I think what the enemy has done is he has gotten us to expect nothing and we have never been disappointed. Come on. Matthew 9.29 says, And he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith be it unto you. God, I think that prophetic word that we had this morning was God saying, listen, I'm getting ready to do some stuff. Turn your expectancy up. Awake out of slumber and be aware of what God is saying. Be aware of how God is moving and be aware that he wants to move in your life. How many times during the week have we walked right by a place of either being used of God or a blessing because we were oblivious to it even being done and we walked right by it because God says you got to believe and you got to be aware. Those guys that Jesus dishealed had to be aware that he was in the area and that he was moving. We have got to lift up our faith and say, God, today I am going to be aware of what you're doing. I'm expecting you to meet all my needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm expecting you to protect me with supernatural protection. I'm expecting you to use me if you need me to be used today. I'm expecting you to deliver me when I need to be delivered. I'm expecting you to do everything this word says to do because I am conscious and I am actively trying to do what you say in your word. Because what I see, uh, guys, I'm, I'm, I, I talk to pastors, uh, I, I talk to Christians all across America and in several countries, and most of them, they can't say they're disappointed because they're not expecting God to do a thing. They have, we have went from taking the land to survival mode. In survival mode, it's not expecting great things, it's just holding on to what little bit you have. Oh, I hope the devil don't find out I'm happy about this because then he's going to take this. And I don't know. Uh, God is saying, no, no, no. You change because your faith is enforcing that. Somewhere along the line, unaware, we let the fire die down in that area. And what we're doing is we're expecting the devil to do everything and God to do nothing. 
and pastors are losing hope. Believers in the pews have lost hope and are beginning devouring the shepherds. I'm seeing that happens. It's like the God that you preach doesn't do anything anymore, and we're tired of doing this. We're and I mean, just so when when you when you get in that way when you're not expecting anything, then all you do is gripe. How many have read the book of Exodus when they got their gripe on? <laughs> when you know, you may get away with griping at your husband or your wife, but don't start griping at God because you start griping at God, fiery serpents will soon appear. Your faith cannot release God's kingdom into your life if you're not walking in expectancy, guys. And I think what God's trying to say is a wake-up call. You were, you were created to function in a fire of God of expectancy, of faith, and of hope. And be more. I don't care what age you are right now. You can be more where you are right now than you ever dreamed if you just let God get a hold of it. That's one of the things I'm, I'm, I'm demanding of me is I know I can do more. I know I can hear more clearly. I know I can get deeper. I know that the gifts that God has given me, that I can use them more proficiently. And the one I get aggravated the most in the entire world, believe it or not, it's not Mary, it's me. <laughs> it's me. Nobody aggravates me like me because I know what's resident in there and I know how I never come close. Because the only way I can come close is the fire. And I, I want to I wanna kind of approach this in a little bit different way because sometimes when we talk about the fire guy, we talk about revival. It's an event. You know, fire's broke out over. Let's go, let's roast, you know, let's roast our hands or whatever, whatever we call revival. But uh, this last week, I, I, I love studying productivity. I love studying things about creativity. And I picked up a book this, this week. It, it, was, it, it wasn't a, a, sacred, a sacred book. It was a secular book. But man, did it strike a chord with me. Because your routines can either empower you or kill you. And I thought about that. And I, I, there, when, when God's gift of writing flows in my life, I, I, it, it, it's anointed. But I only write when, you know, the kind of like the unction's there, you know. And sometimes it can be six months apart. And I know I have a lot of students that say, say you know, when I can write, I can write. But when I can't, it's just the writer's block or whatever. And so I was, I was reading about how all these famous writers, they have a routine. They gear themselves that they have this little routine that they go through. That, you know, you get up in the morning, you shower, you shave, whatever, and you put on this music, you sit at this table, you drink this coffee, and it's the same thing every time. Because what, what it's telling your entire being is, as I'm going through this, I'm preparing to do this. And everything begins to switch in you. And as they do that more and more and more often, then they just sit down and, and their, their minds are open to whatever, and they begin writing the way they should have. And I begin thinking about the temple, how many know that there was, a, there was a morning offering? There was an evening offering. There was a morning time of prayer. There was an evening time of prayer. There were things going on routinely like clockwork. If you had lost your sundial that day, all you had to do is if you're in Jerusalem is to see what was going on in the temple and you knew exactly what time of day it was because there was an exacting routine that God had established for that temple. And when that temple followed the routine from their hearts, the power of God was always in the nation. When they deviated from that routine and added other things to it, like now we're going to do this to Molech or Ashtaroth or whatever, how many know that the power of God began to wane? God began to have me look, and I, I'm, I'm just beginning this process, but I need to realize that what I do, at, like well, about Wednesday, there's some certain routines that I do to start hearing from God on what to preach. And by Saturday morning, like clockwork, whether I want to or not, Mary will testify this, at 6 o'clock, I get up. I have my little routine. I make my coffee. I take my shower. I get my, my clothes on, and I go down to my office. And from about 6.30 to about 8 o'clock, I'm finishing up my sermon. 
because everything that I have done in my routine, I have already thought through, I've prayed through, I've studied during the week, I've put the pieces of the puzzle together, and Saturday morning at 6.30, I am putting those pieces of the puzzle together, and because I have that routine, it always functions without fail. God has spoken to me. Now, there's been a couple, there's, now, this, this shows you the awesomeness of God. There's been sometimes, like during the week, I'm, I'm trying to do it, and this nothing fits together. I woke up on Saturday mornings preaching the sermon. It's like I couldn't get it that week, but because of my routine, it put my spirit in alignment in the right place that I was listening to God, that although my head didn't get it, my spirit was preaching it to me when I got up that morning. I've got up some mornings when, whoo, Mary says, what? I can go write this down. This is good. I, I, I was actually in a pulpit preaching it because of the routine. Did you know in counseling, whether you're studying secular counseling or neuthetic counseling, People have routines of defeat. If you watch people, there, there is a certain trigger or there's a certain thing that they do, they, they'll, then they'll cycle down. Sometimes you can see it in the conversation. Oh, why does this always happen to me? Da, 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 da. And we call it a spiral of defeat. Come on now. And what a counselor will have to do when they start that, he'll say, hey, did you watch the game last week? No. It's, it's to knock them out of that spiral because they've gotten in a routine of defeat. And sometimes we'll, we'll do that with a, uh, with a testimony of defeat in our lives. The devil's doing this. The devil's doing that. We can't go forward. We can't do this. We can't do that. You know what that is? That's giving praise or homage to the devil. We need to learn to have a routine. I don't care what the devil's doing. This is, this is the God that I serve. This is the God I serve. And start declaring how great he is. Not only, sometimes you need to remind yourself, but it's time to develop a new routine. We need to examine even what we do on a daily basis. Is it taking me away from God or is it drawing me to God? I mean, I, I need to do the same thing. There, there are certain things that I do that when, I, when, I'm, when I'm in the mode of exercising every day, if I will do those things, it leads to exercise. How I many know it's been just a little while since that's happened? Because I got, I got away from my routine. But the moment that I start the routine, your body has learned these are the things that you do, and you begin going into that. Next thing you know, I'm wanting to get on the elliptical walker. Then as I'm up there, I'm saying, what in the world's going on? I don't know my body wants to, you know. It's because you get in the routine. What if my routine is to seek him early in the morning. What of my, you know, Smith Wigglesworth's routine when he'd get up in the morning, the minute his feet hit the floor, he would praise God for an hour. Even into his 70s and 80s, he would praise God for an hour. Well, you see, you start out the day like that, you might be able to raise the dead for the day's over with, which he did many times in his ministry. We, we have been so unaware of, of how the things that we're doing, some things the enemy has creeped in to get us to do that has become part of our routine that draws us away from God instead of to him. And I think what God is saying, listen, return. Each one of us have a function, a routine that we should have that's a part of our temple function in our service to God every day. And we need to return to that. I mean, it used to be that I would have either preaching or praise and worship blurring on the radio as I drive in the town. Now I'm, I'm going through the thousand things I need to do during the day and all that. And I'm thinking, well, where did I get, why did, why did I get away from playing the radio? It's just like it snuck up on me. And so by the time I get to town, I am so cognizant of how overwhelmed I am by all the things I need to do that day that I forget the power of the God that I serve who can make the overwhelming very underwhelming when he's through with it. You want to add a little spice into your marriage, have a routine of showing gratitude to one another. Uh, one of the things that, now Mary will tell you this, and I think it's this way in a lot of families. We put on a mask for everybody else, but when we're really aggravated, we, we, we kind of we really show ourselves to our family. Come on, that's just, everybody does that. And I, I have purposed to not do that. 
You know, nobody in the world should I give more respect to than that woman just simply because she's lived with me for over 30 years. I mean, she deserves a medal and a trophy and a, and a couple other things. But she knows me more than anybody else. Doesn't she deserve the best side of me? But yet we have the, we have the routine of just smiling to the world and then just ripping everything apart when we get home. That's got to stop. Now, I'm not talking about reversing it and ripping up the world and being nice when you come home. If you're aggravated, you go, into, you go into prayer with God and say, God, I'm really aggravated. I really want to have a flesh out, and so I'm going to tell you how I feel so that you can get me where I need to be. But not taking it out on others. And I, I, I used to be real bad about that. If I had a bad day, just, Mary, just, just go in your man cave, just something. And we need to change that routine of being gracious to one another. How many routines has the devil written in our life and have, were not penned by the hand of God? That's part of what God is calling us to awareness to. Are, are the little routines that we go through, are they benefiting us? Are they tearing us apart? Are they slowly poisoning us? Because here, here's the deal. If my routines are wrong, I can have the fire of God in my life, but it slowly begins to get choked out by the routines. I'm slowly taking the oxygen away from the fire. I'm slowly pulling the rug out of, from underneath my faith. And we've got to take a hard look at that, guys. I'm kind of grateful in a week I go on two weeks vacation. I don't have to worry about this school for two whole weeks. <laughs> you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start looking at everything that Mike Lake does, and I'm going to start looking at my routines. And I'm going to start saying, this needs to change, and this needs to change. This isn't serving me well. This serves me well. I think I'll go ahead and maybe work on this and enhance this a little bit more. Come on. Because as I learn to function in the routines of the temple, I keep the fire burning in all three areas of my life. Because what I'm looking for is when you read the book of Acts, that's normal. That's not, that's not exceptional. That is the norm. And guys, we're so far below normal. I'm waiting for us to have a prayer meeting here and the whole building starts to shake. That was normal. They didn't freak out. Or the fire of God fall. That, that didn't freak anybody out. That was normal to them. And so God is saying, listen, if you want to go to biblically normal, you were created to function with the fire of God, and it was created to be in all three areas of your life. And it's not that you need to get the fire. If you're born again, you got the fire. We need to learn, we need to learn how to service the fire so that it burns brightly in our lives. I'm so tired of being abnormal. I, I want to get to normal in the Word of God. I want to look and say, yeah, I'm doing that. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. That's how I'm functioning. And then we'll start seeing some of the results that they get in the Bible. But guys, we, we have got to realign ourselves. God is calling us. Yeah, we're talking about fire, but we're talking about being aware. And how many know that if you're ever dealing with fire, the first thing you need to be is aware? God is calling us to a new level of awareness because the enemy, the little foxes spoil the vine. And Satan has gotten in on so many areas and gotten, just tweaked you just a little bit to where you're looking to the wrong things to make you feel better. You're looking to the wrong things. You're doing the wrong things and there's this downward spiral going on. And God is saying, if you would just turn this, this one little thing, it would make such a dynamic in your life. Listen to my spirit that as I teach you and I bring these things, write them down, say, okay, now this is what I am doing. What should I be doing? And begin working on that until it becomes habit. And do it aware. I'm doing this on purpose because I know if I do this, it's going to cause this and this and this in my life. When you wake up in the morning, how about being awake? Don't be on autopilot. Be awake. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. 
Be sensitive. As, as, as God was teaching me this week, there were several things I started that was my normal things to do. And God said, don't do that. Don't do it that way because it's, it's, it's actually pulling away from you, not adding to you. Do it this way. And so I would tweak what I was doing. I'd be, I'll be amazed. All of a sudden, things just start falling into place a little bit different, a little bit better. Because the devil had snuck one little thing in that tripped it up, that got it going in the wrong direction. God is calling us to, to examine ourselves. And I'm not talking about a condemnation type of examining. I'm talking about an empowering kind of examining. What's working for me? If it works, praise God. Enhance it, highlight it, celebrate it. If it's not working, change it. <laughs> change it. Find out what God wants to put in that area for him to empower and to keep the fire burning and maybe to get it to burn brighter. Most of us, I think all we are right now are hot coals. And God is saying, listen, if you just, if you just listen to me. And, and God will show you when, on times that your routine should be fasting and your routine should be prayer. And, your, and there's some different things that he's going to do in your life. When he does, it's addling kindling to the coals and it's blowing on the coals to ignite them again. And then our greatest service to God is when he comes back, he finds the fire burning. He's going to come as a thief in the night. Is he going to find the fire burning the way that it should be in our lives? Because we've allowed the routines to be kingdom routines instead of worldly routines in our lives. Father, I just thank you for the word this morning. Father, I ask that you would absolutely open our eyes, Father. Take us out of autopilot. And, Father, let us see our lives with a fresh set of eyes. Father, let us see what empowers us. Let us see what trips us up. And, Father, let us, let us convert every routine into one that the kingdom can function in to better our lives, to better our families, and to better the kingdom of God for its furtherance in our lives. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.